I'm called upon to honor a man whose name will be joined in the history of our movement with those of Bertrand Russell, Robert Ingersoll, Thomas Paine, David Hume. He's a writer and an orator with a matchless style, commanding a vocabulary and a range of literary and historical illusion far wider than anybody I know. And I live in Oxford, his alma mater and mine. He's a reader whose breadth of reading is simultaneously so deep and comprehensive as to deserve the slightly stuffy word learned, except that Christopher is the least stuffy learned person you will ever meet. He's a debater who will kick the stuffing out of a hapless victim, yet he does it with a grace that disarms his opponent while simultaneously eviscerating him. He's emphatically not of the all too common school that thinks the winner of a debate is he who shouts loudest. His opponents may shout and shriek, be they do, but Hitch doesn't need to shout. His words, his polymathic store of facts and allusions, his commanding generalship of the field of discourse, the fork lightning of his wit. I tried to sum it up in my review of God is Not Great in the Times of London. There is much fluttering in the dovecot of the deluded, and Christopher Hitchens is one of those responsible. Another is the philosopher A.C. Grayling. I shared a platform with both. We were to debate against a trio of, as it turned out, rather half-hearted religious apologists. Of course, I don't believe in a god with a long white beard, but I hadn't met Hitchens before, and I got an idea of what to expect when Grayling emailed me to discuss tactics. After proposing a couple of lines of attack for himself and me, he concluded, and Hitch will spray AK-47 ammo at the enemy in characteristic style. Grayling's engaging caricature misses Hitchens' ability to temper his pugnacity with old-fashioned courtesy, and spray suggests a scattershot fusillade, which underestimates the deadly accuracy of his marksmanship. If you are a religious apologist invited to debate with Christopher Hitchens, decline. His witty repartee, his ready access store of historical quotations, his bookish eloquence, his effortless flow of well-formed and beautifully spoken words would threaten your arguments even if you had good ones to deploy. A string of reverends and theologians ruefully discovered this during Hitchens' barnstorming book tour around the United States. With characteristic effrontery, he took his tour through the Bible Belt State, the reptilian brain of Southern and Middle America, rather than the easier pickings of the country's cerebral cortex to the north and down the coasts. The plaudits he received were all the more gratifying. Something is stirring in that great country." End of quote. Christopher Hitchens is known as a man of the left, except that he's too complex a thinker to be placed on a single left-right continuum. By the way, I've long been surprised that the very idea of a single left-right political spectrum works at all. Psychologists need many mathematical dimensions in order to locate the human personality. And why should political opinion be any different? With most people, it's surprising how much of the variance is explained by the single dimension we call left-right. If you know somebody's opinion on, say, the death penalty, you can usually guess their opinion on taxation or public health. But Christopher is a one-off. He is unclassifiable. He might be described as a contrarian, except that he has specifically and correctly disavowed the title. He is uniquely placed in his own multidimensional space. You don't know what he will say about anything until you hear him say it. When he does, he will say it so well, back it up so fully, that if you want to argue against him, you'd better be on your guard. He's known throughout the world as one of the leading public intellectuals anywhere. He's written many books and countless articles. He's an intrepid traveler and a war reporter of signal valor. But of course, he has a special place in our affections as the leading intellect and scholar of our atheist secular movement, a formidable adversary to the pretentious, the woolly-minded, or the intellectually dishonest. He's a gently encouraging friend to the young, to the diffident, to those tentatively feeling their way into the life of the freethinker and not certain where it will take them. And I saw this during the uh, signing that we had earlier this afternoon. We treasure his bon mots. Now I'll just quote a few of my favorites. From the penetratingly logical, that which can be asserted without evidence can be dismissed without evidence. 
to the cuttingly witty. Everybody does have a book in them, but in most cases that's where it should stay. To the courageously unconventional, Mother Teresa was not a friend of the poor. She was a friend of poverty. She said that suffering was a gift from God. She spent her life opposing the only known cure for poverty, which is the empowerment of women and the emancipation of them from a livestock version of compulsory reproduction. The following is vintage hitch. I suppose that one reason I've always detested religion is its sly tendency to insinuate the idea that the universe is designed with you in mind. Or even worse, that there is a divine plan into which one fits, whether one knows it or not. This kind of modesty is too arrogant for me. And what about this? Organized religion is violent, irrational, intolerant, allied to racism, tribalism and bigotry, invested in ignorance and hostile to free inquiry, contemptuous of women and coercive towards children. And this, everything about Christianity is contained in the pathetic image of the flock. His respect for women and their rights shines forth. Who are your favorite heroines in real life? The women of Afghanistan, Iraq and Iran, who risk their lives and their beauty to defy the foulness of theocracy. Though not a scientist, and with no pretensions in that direction, he understands the importance of science in the advancement of our species and the destruction of religion and superstition. One was stated plainly, religion comes from the period of human prehistory when nobody, not even the mighty Democritus, who concluded that all matter was made from atoms, had the smallest idea what was going on. It comes from the bawling and fearful infancy of our species and is a babyish attempt to meet our inescapable demand for knowledge, as well as for comfort, reassurance, and other infantile needs. Today, the least educated of my children knows much more about the natural order than any of the founders of religion. He has inspired and energized and encouraged us. He has us cheering him on almost daily. He's even begotten a new word, the H-slap. We don't just admire his intellect, we admire his pugnacity, his spirit, his refusal to countenance ignoble compromise, his forthrightness, his indomitable spirit, his brutal honesty, and in the very way he's looking his illness in the eye, he's embodying one part of the case against religion. Leave it to the religious to mule and whimper at the feet of an imaginary deity in their fear of death. Leave it to them to spend their lives in denial of its reality. Hitch is looking it squarely in the eye, not denying it, not giving in to it, but facing up to it, squarely and honestly, and with a courage that inspires us all. Before his illness, it was as an erudite author and essayist, a sparkling, devastating speaker, that this valiant horseman led the charge against the follies and lies of religion. Since his illness, he's added another weapon to his armory and ours, perhaps the most formidable and powerful weapon of all. His very character has become an outstanding and unmistakable symbol of the honesty and dignity of atheism, as well as of the worth and dignity of the human being when not debased by the infantile babblings of religion. Every day, he's demonstrating the falsehood of that most squalid of Christian lies, but there are no atheists in foxholes. Hitch is in a foxhole, and he's dealing with it with a courage and honesty and a dignity that any of us would be and should be proud to be able to muster. In the process, he's showing himself to be even more deserving of our admiration, respect and love. I was asked to honor Christopher Hitchens today. I need hardly say that he does me the far greater honor by accepting this award in my name. Ladies and gentlemen, comrades, I give you Christopher Hitchens. Well, I'm overwhelmed, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, and I did promise Richard that if, if, I, if my voice didn't go to rags, I would try and speak to you a bit, if that's all right. In acknowledgement, but I do so acutely aware that I'm the one standing between you and the Saturday night fever, and the bars and the entertainments and so forth, and also we have a Q&A with them. So I'll be to us. As far as it lies within my power, I was still involved in the full of presidential impeachment in Washington. You may remember we had to learn a lot about a woman called Jennifer Flowers. Do you recall? Her name spelled with a G. 
Merchant. Merchant was the beauty of houses great in the year. I said, always beware of women who spell gladiators with a W. Anything like that, he does this, the president plunged on. In the, in the course of this, I had to discover about her. Now, she'd once entered a Marilyn Monroe lookalike contest and had come forth. You may picture, therefore, comrades, my emotions receiving not just the Richard Dawkins prize, but the Richard Dawkins prize from his own hands. I'm to plead partly guilty of that myself. I thought it better come up with something before anyone else did. And it was supposed to be the four horsemen of the counter apocalypse. But there it is. We got settled with it, answer, of course. Long may this illusion flourish. It's promoted me to parity with Professors Dawkins and Dennis and Sam Harris. And I have set my whole life, I'd like to think, against the spread of delusion. Rather wish this one a fair wind. It's rather nice to be uh, associated in that, in that uh, company. It is true, however, that if we hadn't done it, someone was going to. It was going to have to be some kind of a pushback against what we could see coming. It was going to be a volunteer effort. It was going to communicate itself that way. How else were we going to reply to the increasing menace, rising menace of Islamic Jihad? How are we going to, uh, for example, deal with the emergence of probably the most reactionary papacy since the mid-19th century? Um, how, how are we going... Excuse me. I'm so sorry. I have to cough for a little bit. I was afraid this would happen. I'm, I'm too, too terribly apologizing. Um, a, a very reactionary Eastern Orthodox Church, if it comes to that, as well, the Eastern, the Eastern Catholic forces, now ranged, many of them, behind the dark and sinister figure of Vladimir Putin. Uh, then one mustn't exempt, of course, the millennial settlers in Palestine who believe that by bringing in as many fanatics of Jewish origin as they can and forcing out as many Palestinian Arabs as they can, they may bring on the Messiah and indeed the Apocalypse. I look forward to the common destruction of our species with relish. And this is, I think, there's a special responsibility upon us, uh, uh, particularly because the backers of these people tend to be in the United States. And though many of them don't like the Jewish people and have uh, no love for, um, always have accepted Jesus as their personal savior, they nonetheless are prepared to support extreme Jews, rather as the road used to support the hanging man, make use of him while he brings on the Messiah. And then our reign of tribulation can begin too. What a wonderful bargain to be offering a democratic country, which it is sometimes accused, you've heard it, of being overstrident before my voice went. I sometimes got accused of it too. It's a bit more reasonable in my case. I'm a sort of street fighting polemicist from way back. I ask for it and I get it and I can dish it out. 